for your prepositions. Good afternoon or good evening. And, uh, uh, thank you all for joining us this afternoon or evening. My name is Nadia Rubai. Um, along with Max Pensky, I am uh, a co-director uh, at the Institute for Genocide and Mass Atrocity Prevention here at Binghamton University. The three-part mission of IGMAP, as we refer to it on campus, is to increase understanding, develop commitment, and build capacity for atrocity prevention, to bring all of the forces of a modern university, in this case Binghamton University, to bear on genocide and atrocity prevention, and to break down the barriers that impede prevention, those barriers that exist between academic disciplines, between the public, private, and nonprofit sectors, and between the academy and the world of practice. And one of the ways in which we promote that mission is through a signature program which we refer to as Practitioners in Residence. And through this program, we bring to campus a series of individuals who work in a variety of ways in the field of prevention. And we ask them to spend a week on Binghamton University's campus. Uh, they attend classes and talk with students in and outside of the classroom. They meet with groups of faculty to talk about their research, and they make a public presentation. Um, and our, this week, our guest has been Dr. Stephen Lucker. Stephen is a Binghamton native, a Binghamton University alum, um, and has a family connection to the museum at Binghamton University. So we're particularly pleased to welcome him back to the community and to the campus as a practitioner in residence with IGMAP. And we're very happy to be able to partner with the University Art Museum and thank Diane Butler um, for her um, collaboration um, and offering that wonderful talk here this evening. Steve completed his BA in history in 1980 and a PhD in modern European history in 1993 here at Binghamton University. As a doctoral student and immediately following his studies, um, he taught European history at several campuses in the SUNY system and at George Mason University. He joined the U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum as a historian in the Wexner Learning Center in 1994, uh, so essentially immediately following completion of his PhD. The following year, he became curator of the permanent exhibition, and in that capacity, he was responsible for selection and incorporation of artifacts, researching and writing exhibition texts, and handling all issues and inquiries pertaining to the exhibition. He currently serves as senior program curator in the Levine Institute for Holocaust Education, which is the world's premier institution promoting quality Holocaust education with programs reaching an estimated 15 million people worldwide each year. These include students, teachers, the general public, um, as well as the American military, judiciary, law enforcement, and government officials. He authored the companion volume to the exhibition, The Art and Politics of Arthur Sykes, and co-authored State of Deception, The Power of Nazi Propaganda. We are here today on Holocaust Remembrance Day, uh, but I think you will see that Dr. Luckert's career path and his life demonstrate that we can and must remember not only on a designated day, uh, but every day throughout the year. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Steve Luckert, who will speak with us today about Holocaust and genocide in museums in the 21st century, challenges and opportunities. Nadia, thank you for that very warm introduction. I, I have to say uh, how deeply honored I've been to, uh, to be here at Binghamton University and to be a practitioner in residence at the Institute for Genocide and Mass Atrocity Prevention. I've got to make some new friends like Nadia, Max, Sebastian, and Stephen, and I think it's going to be the beginning of a very warm and long friendship and partnership that's going to last well into the future. And I, I'm honored that Binghamton University established such an, an institute. Its, its importance goes without saying. Now, I also want to thank Diane Butler, first of all, for allowing me to speak in this venue, because this gallery has a lot of importance to me. It's filled with a lot of memories. Uh, as, uh, as Nadia mentioned, I have a deep personal connection to this. Uh, my father worked in this art gallery for 
in the 1960s up to about 1983. And uh, so not only is his spirit here, but also a lot of those friends and professors that I had, people like Ed Wilson, who was you know, a, a great friend and a, a remarkable sculptor. Ken Lindsay, who I'm always gonna be indebted to, not only for bringing my father here to work, but for all the advice he gave me when I was pursuing my academic career. And uh, so Ken has been one of those people that has always you know, remained in my heart. Angelo Apolito, uh, also a, a fine artist. One of his paintings hangs in my, in my house today. And it's a further reminder of, of all these great memories that are attached to Binghamton University and to this particular museum and art gallery. And I also want to call out Ronnie Gonzalez, who's been a friend. We went to school here. Ronnie goes, is, uh, you know, is kind of that bridge from the past into the future. And Ronnie was, uh, uh, has remained a friend over all these years and was a friend of my father. So he, so he keeps that spirit alive and that tradition alive. Now, when I was thinking about this, this lecture, and I want to point out one more thing that I almost forgot to say about this, this place. This was the first, this was the place where I curated my first exhibition. Probably few people know that. It wasn't necessarily my most successful exhibition, <laughs> mind you, but it, I did that as an undergraduate. And one of the things that I'm, I, I think Diane is doing the right thing is letting students curate exhibitions because it's a great experience. And I think it's, it's something that allows you to, to be creative and also critical. And I think that's so important today. But as I was preparing for this talk, I kept thinking about how my own life and kind of Holocaust studies and genocide prevention have kind of been interconnected. You know, back here when in the, I hate to say it, but it was in the 1970s when I first started uh, attending school here at, at Binghamton University. It's my, this was my first exposure to the study of the Holocaust as an academic discipline. Now, this was back in about 1978. Now, many of you were not born then, but that was a pivotal year in many ways for the, for Holocaust studies. It was a time in which there was a made-for-TV film uh, called Holocaust uh, that was gained, it, it was gained worldwide attention. It starred Meryl Streep and a young Meryl Streep and James Woods and Fritz Weaver and Tova Felshu and a host, whole cast of others. But it was at that same time that Binghamton offered a course on the Holocaust. It was uh, done by Professor David Beale. And what was interesting about it is it was Binghamton was pioneering in that. There were very few institutions, academic institutions, that were teaching about the Holocaust. But Binghamton was one of those. And I think the approach that was taken was very interesting because it was kind of a multidisciplinary approach. So not only did we read Holocaust memoir literature, but we saw films, we read the then, it was kind of a rather sparse academic literature on the topic, but we read that. Uh, we also, he also brought in a Holocaust survivor. That was appropriate. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> to, to speak to our class. And also to, to look at uh, different approaches to how we understand the Holocaust, from, psycho from psychoanalytic approaches to behavioral approaches. And it also benefited from the fact that there was another professor involved. That, that was Ken Jacobs from the cinema department. Now, Ken was doing a course, I believe, at the same time called the Jew in Cinema, and where he was analyzing the way Jews had been portrayed in, in the cinema. And so the kind of inner, that kind of interdisciplinary approach 
was very interesting in looking at how the imagery you know, works and, and examining films. And I thought that was extremely valuable. But I th thought back to, at that time, 1978, at another event that happened the same time. And that was President Jimmy Carter, after seeing this made-for-TV film on the Holocaust, decided to create the President's Commission on the Holocaust. And there was, of course, a movement by Holocaust survivors to create a memorial in the United States. But it was a, res a result of the, this, this exposure to the Holocaust that he called and that he uh, created this commission. And eventually that resulted in the creation of the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum in, 19 in 1993. And the other thing I kept thinking about was, 1993, I finished my PhD at Binghamton. And then a little did I know that six months later I'd be working at the museum. And so it was one of these things where you, you see all these interactions there between the, you know, what was happening in my life and also in my academic studies and what was happening uh, in regard to the Holocaust. Now this is a photograph from the opening of the, uh, the museum in, in April of 1993, and this this was a very uh, a very powerful occasion. You know the building is we're a federal agency it was constructed on federal land but built with private funds. It's a very interesting private uh, public partnership, and the. Uh, the building itself is, is, was created, by, designed by a, a German refugee, Jewish refugee, James Ingo Fried, who created this. But the, and over the course of time, the Holocaust Museum in Washington kind of surprised a lot of people. Initially, when, when it was set up, we didn't know how many people would want to come to the museum. Some people said, oh, maybe only 50,000, maybe 100,000 people will want to visit this museum. But we get almost 2 million visitors a year. And this has been quite astounding because over the course of time, you know, we've had 44 million visitors come to the museum. It's, it's continued to be about the same level we get. And also at the same time, you had the expansion of both Holocaust studies as a discipline, and also the creation of genocide studies and scholarship. You know, more than, we've had more than 600 scholars that have come to the museum to, to work on this, and, we, we, and there are about 200 or so Holocaust and genocide centers on university campuses. Uh, I think, in many ways, Binghamton is, is very different in the, the focus on prevention, rather than just merely studying past genocides. And if you think about this, the study of the Holocaust or the interest in the Holocaust, not just only a national one, but a global one. That you have, for instance, at the State Museum at Auschwitz, Birkenau, you get over a, mi a million people visiting that, including a number, of, a growing number of visitors from the Far East, from Asia, who are interested in this history. Yad Vashem in Jerusalem gets almost a million people. Uh, other genocide museums, like in Kigali in Rwanda, attract visitors from all over the world, dignitaries, to go and, and learn about this, about uh, the genocide in Rwanda. Now, when we opened in 1993, we, our exhibition you know, was an award-winning exhibition and it was, it was extremely popular, but very different from many other museums in that the people that created the museum didn't come out of traditional museum backgrounds. These were people that came out of film, out of theater. So they had, took a different approach than a traditional uh, museum approach. And they wanted to highlight the use of film so there are hours of uh, footage in the, in the exhibition. They also wanted to use a lot of photographs to use the power of images and also to use artifacts. Now, initially, they, the founding director of the museum said, you don't need artifacts. 
He thought, ah, he, he didn't work. He, the only experience he had in the museum was one that had no artifacts before. So he thought, you, you don't need artifacts to tell this story. And wisely, he was convinced that was not the right way to go. And so they began looking all over for artifacts and collecting artifacts. And now we get about one collection a day or so that arrive at the museum. And which is quite remarkable we've, uh, that the number of collections that have come in, we've gone all over the world to microfilm or digitize collections in dozens of countries. And so what we've got on one hand is this global interest in the topic of the Holocaust. But we're facing a lot of challenges as well, which I, I want to discuss, and as well as some great opportunities. One of those issues, of course, is preserving the past. And sometimes we don't tend to think about this, but the importance of bringing in these artifacts, collecting these documents before they disappear is extremely important. And I often think about this too with, with cases today uh, or in the recent past of genocides or mass atrocities, that who's collecting this? Who's gonna preserve this material? You had a concerted effort after the Second World War to document these, and in, in that, whether that's at the Jewish Historical Institute in Poland, or whether it's at some of the memorials that were set up, or Yad Vashem, or in France, there were efforts to bring in these documents, these collections of, of Holocaust, uh, relating to the Holocaust. But you didn't have the, necessarily the same approach as being taken towards contemporary genocides. And so I wonder to you know what's going to happen in the future, you know, if no one collects this material and preserves it because it's so important. And, I, and the difficulties of preserving that past are are immense. I the, you, what you see before were shoes that we have on loan from the State Museum of Majdanek in in Lublin, Poland. And we have about 4,000 shoes that we borrow, that we have on loan from them. And, um, but they all require treatment, and they, they're disintegrating before our very own eyes. There's nothing really you can do to stop that. This gives you some idea of, of that kind of, how the, the, the leather is disintegrating, breaking apart, and that's gonna happen. There's nothing you can really do. You can try to stabilize that. Those people who know, for instance, about the, uh, the mounds of hair that were discovered at Auschwitz know that that, that too is disintegrating and that that it has changed color over the course of time and it's being subject to all the, you know, th of, of the years that the passage of time is kind of um, taking its toll on those artifacts. But the passage of time doesn't just affect Artifacts, it also affects, for instance, survivors and other witnesses of the Holocaust. Where what we're seeing is the passing of that survivor generation, which is, you know, uh, is for me especially, uh, is, is very sad because not only are they great witnesses of what happened and great, uh, and great spokesmen to, to younger generations about what transpired, but they bring a wealth of knowledge that sometimes we don't even tap into. I often tell about, you know, stories about when I would be translating a document, a German document. You translate it, you know, accurately, but then you talk to a survivor and they say, well, that's not really what it means. That there's code in there. And if you don't know that, you're gonna miss the whole point of what's in that because you had people writing at that time trying to sneak information through, through, through the censors. So sometimes they would say, well, they'd make some reference to somebody's passing through the town. And it's a reference to these, the Nazi killers that had carried out actions in those particular ghettos. And it was a way of conveying that to someone else in another town, that there are, that people have been killed and that this is going on. But without having survivors to be able to interpret all of that, you're gonna lose that. 
The other thing, of course, that you have is, uh, and I found this photograph. I had never seen this photograph, actually. I was going through, working on this, this, um, this presentation. And I started going through our, our photo archives. And I found this photograph, and it was a counter-protest by Holocaust deniers when we opened up. And you, I don't know if you could see it, about you know, six million lies, and you see the Confederate flag, you see all these th you know, things attacking the, um, uh, denying the Holocaust. And I kept thinking about, well, it's reminiscent of what we've seen in recent years that it struck me about how contemporary this was. But it's not only the, it's the denial of the Holocaust that I think we're seeing, but also the distortion of it for political purposes. That what we see, for instance, in, in, in many places in Europe is that ways in which they don't deny the Holocaust, but they deny responsibility of their nation or parts of that nation in, the, in collaborating or, or being complicit in the Holocaust and attribute it all to, to Germans or to, or in some cases to, uh, they've built upon decades of myths that are being challenged by current scholarship. And so you have a, a lot of changes going on in that way. So we're facing that challenge. But even more so, we're facing challenges in, in audiences. That the audiences of, uh, to the museum have changed over the course of time, and the way that they learn has changed. And I'll talk a little bit about that. I mean, here you have, this is something that's relatively new in the last five years, and that is allowing people to take photographs within the exhibition. When I when I started out, you weren't allowed to do that for a variety of reasons. I mean, the, in, in some cases, it had to do with copyright because a lot of those images ha are copyrighted by particular archives, and if you let a third party you know, take a photograph, you can't transfer that right to that third party. So it became, it was kind of an, a legal issue that had to be worked out. But this becomes a, a way in which people remember what they saw and they take those memories with them, which is an important thing, but the, the need to use this, this uh, technology, which I'll address, to kind of counter some of the, the problems that we're facing. Um, and one of those, uh, which I'll talk about, uh, has to do with reading. Now we don't tend to, sometimes we don't tend to take this very seriously, but over the course of time, Museum audiences have changed in the amount of time they spend reading, and what and how much they'll read. Uh, when I was cura uh, first came in as curator of the permanent exhibition, they were saying main text panel should be no longer than 150 words. Well, the longest panel in the permanent exhibition is 400 words, and many of them are way over that. So it's a text-heavy exhibition. But then, a couple of years after that, they said, the museum officials said, no, 150 words is way too much. 80 words. And now, museum professionals are saying, well, you've got to get them in the first couple of sentences. Because the amount of time that visitors, particularly younger visitors, spend look, reading a text has declined precipitously throughout the United States, and it's also in Europe as well. It's not, a, it's not something that's, that's uh, just particular to the United States. So that if you don't catch them in those first couple of seconds, they'll spend a couple of seconds there, and if you don't catch them there with the main point you want to make, they're not going to get it. So that's a, that's a challenge that, that we have to face and how to make our exhibitions, how to make our work much more engaging to younger audiences. You know, when I came to the museum, th we didn't have a website. The internet wasn't a big thing. You know, it, was, it had gone into really, uh, into action in 1993, the same year, but it wasn't, you know, widespread at that stage. And, uh, 
And I, the first place I worked at was the Wexner Learning Center, which was a multimedia database. And it was very popular. We're seeing this cutting edge. There was a professor here that, who used to be here, went to the work at the National Gallery in Washington. And she was on a panel, you know, and said, this is, this is the way of the future. Well, the internet killed that off. You know, no longer do people have to stay in a room to learn more about it. They could go to the, their computer. That's before smartphones and all that, but they could go to their computer to get that. I'll just give you some, and this gives you some idea about how many people are using the internet and social media today. Uh, wait a minute, I had some. This is how, these are what those early computer databases looked like. Um, but, and this is, this shows, this gives you kind of an idea of the, of the, the, um, the text and all of that. What's interesting about the exhibition is that on the fourth floor, you have visitors spending a lot of time reading. But then once you get to the next floor, the fourth floor is the, the, the start of the exhibition. It's three floors. Once you get to the next floor, it's something more emotive, something more uh, effective takes over. And so they're more, they, uh, and in some ways it also changes a bit and it becomes much more environmental. But people spend more time looking at, at images than they do in reading text. And this could be because of you know, fatigue or it could be from, of, for a variety of other things. Uh, the other thing that, that it was kind of startling is that even though the Holocaust, Holocaust studies has become kind of a, a global, uh, has, you know, has become you know, global and international, some of the findings recently are kind of disturbing. So that, for instance, this year in, in Great Britain, they, they released this figure that, uh, that mo the majority of British adults don't, don't uh, know or think that six million Jews died in the Holocaust. And that 5% of them don't think it happened at all. And you have kind of similar figures in the United States and that 31% of, of this of Americans believe it was significantly less than six million, and most of them say it's two million, most of that group think it's two million or less. And th that the figure that hold those views is much higher among millennials. That is, it's younger people, not an older generation that holds those views. And so it raises questions about the level, about Holocaust education in schools and what are they getting out of it which is something that we're kind of facing because, you know, although Holocaust education is mandated in many states, often teachers have 90 minutes to teach about the Holocaust. And so for many of them, the answer to that is play a movie. Play part of Schindler's List or the boy in the striped pajamas. And so that becomes... Or, or just to have maybe have them read uh, the diary of Anne Frank, so that might be their only exposure to it. But it doesn't necessarily build kind of critical thinking. And the the other, and I'm not sure, for instance, today how much is taught about more contemporary genocides or mass atrocities. My suspicion is that that knowledge of the Holocaust is public knowledge of the Holocaust is far greater than it is about genocides that occurred in Bosnia or Rwanda or Darfur or other places. And we found that out you know, as we were doing exhibitions and other things, when, when you ask younger audiences about that, they know so little. It's, it's puzzling and they don't, they don't understand it. And so that becomes a challenge also. Um, let me just, I wanna go back to one more thing. And that's also the need to reach international audiences with this history. Um, this, is a, this is a photograph that was taken in Burundi of people, of people looking at a, an exhibition that I curated. Now, I've never been to Burundi, but, the, but uh, I'll explain a little bit about this. This was an exhibition that I that I curated called State of Deception, The Power of Nazi Propaganda. It opened up at the, the museum 2009. 
and it ran for about three years, became our most popular special exhibition ever. About 1.7 million people went through that in Washington. Then it started traveling around the United States in one version. And then UNESCO in Paris got interested in it. They saw the importance and relevance of the topic to what was going on today with hate speech and, and disinformation and misinformation and incitement to genocide. And they said, we need to have that. So it opened up in, uh, in 2016 at Paris uh, headquarters of UNESCO. The Secretary General of UNESCO was there and spoke at the opening. And they had various people there. The mayor of Paris came and she saw it. She said, I got to have this at the Hotel de Ville. She had it and it was advertised there. Other French institutions wanted it, so it spread like that. A professor in Tunisia came in and said, I have to have this exhibition in Tunisia because we're encountering ex a violent extremism. He himself had been targeted by Islamists and has to have a bodyguard to protect him. And he said, we need the, and also Tunisia supplied the most at that stage fighters for ISIS. And so he said, we have to do something to counter this kind of movement of extremism. And he thought the exhibition would be one way to do it. The UN saw that this was important. And so the UN worked with us to create uh, versions, smaller versions of this exhibition in about a dozen languages, including Swahili, French, Arabic, um, Hungarian, uh, uh, Russian, Ukrainian, and it, it proved to be very successful. When, they, when this went up in Burundi, they sent this. Since it's, it's been in Rwanda, it's been in Bangladesh, it's been in Hungary, it's been in Tunisia, it's been in a variety of different places around the globe. And often you get international visitors, you know, when I talk about this, they'll say, we need this in our country. We need this in Pakistan, we need this in, in Sri Lanka. I was at, uh, when I was in Brussels not that long ago, I met with someone who was in the league to counter racism and intolerance in Europe. He's from Sri Lanka and he said to me, he said, you know, maybe you need to direct more efforts to what's happening in Asia. Because he said in a lot of places in Asia, the Nazis are seen as good, that Hitler's, a, Hitler's not seen as an evil figure, that the perception that they have is one of somebody that fight, fought against imperialism, et cetera, that they don't, think, they don't associate Adolf Hitler and the Nazis with, with genocide. And he said, you, you know, as that economy grows, as Asia becomes more and more important, you've got to go reach those areas, that those are, important, those are areas that need to be told about, about, um, about the Holocaust, about Nazi propaganda, about, about genocide, that we can, that reaching out to the public in those countries, you know, might have an effect. So that's something that we're looking more and more into. And this is another, let me see if I can get to this. How can I? Okay, good. Oh, did I go back? Wait, minute, can I go back to, can you click on that website? Thank you. All right. Well, in case it doesn't come up, the, the use of technology, of course, can be an important tool in raising awareness. Back in about 2005 or so, the museum partnered with Google Earth. And we did that to uh, highlight what was going on in Darfur. To sh and what you see, what, what they did is they took those satellite photographs that showed how the Janjaweed and, and the Sudanese army had destroyed villages. And you actually saw from these satellite photographs those burned out villages. And you could see it on a larger scale and it could zoom right down in there. So you were face to face seeing, seeing at the time the kind of de destruction that was taking place. Another way in which we've kind of harnessed technology was to, to say, well, let's raise awareness during, by using these photographs, uh, projecting these photographs from Darfur 
on the side of our building. So the people driving down uh, 14th Street, 15th Street could see these, or, pa- or people passing down the, down the street would see this and, and would stick in their heads and, and get them to think about their own responsibilities. And here's another example of that. We also did a lot of work about raising awareness about genocide. This is also deals with Darfur, but the entire, uh, this is on the second floor of the museum, and we've been doing more and more work dealing with contemporary issues there, so that we've had things dealing with Syria, we've had things dealing with Cambodia, we've done, we've done a thing from uh, dealing with, uh, it's, it's called From Memory to Action, to get people to think about their own responsibilities today uh, by raising awareness of what's happening. Uh, and I show this for two reasons. I don't know if you can see the woman in the back. She's a Binghamton alum. That's Bridget Conley. I don't know if Max, if, I don't know if you recognize her. It's probably, but Bridget Conley, uh, I worked with her for a number of years. She was one of Max's students. And Bridget now is, uh, is very active in the, in the field of genocide studies. And uh, she's moved on to Tufts University, where she heads a uh, institution there. But, uh, but Bridget um, graduated from Binghamton with a PhD in comp lit and uh, went on to, d- to do great work and continues to do great work in this. But here she is educating people, students, about what was happening in Darfur. And I think this becomes so important because these are very complicated issues. And if you can get someone that's a good educator that can get that across to a general, uh, uh, the general public, it's, it's so crucial. Because one of the things that I find with a lot of human rights activists is that they speak to each other. They don't speak to the general public. And I think that's one of the problems that we face, is that, that if you're only talking to yourself, you're not reaching out to people that need to know. And uh, so the museum has been working to not only educate the, the public. Can we get, is it, let's see if this one. Uh, see, this is when technology becomes your enemy and not your friend. But um, this was just to, I'll, t- I'll explain what this was. This was, we kept thinking about what are ways in which we can get across to, y- to younger audiences, way, uh, ways to interact with, with contemporary events. And so this was something that we didn't design this exhibition, but we brought it to the museum. And it was kind of this, I don't know what you describe it like a, almost like a cargo trailer. We had it in the, uh, in the uh, on the second floor of the uh, uh, the building, and what visitors would go in there and they'd speak to Syrian refugees, so that they could talk to them and ask them they could ask questions back and forth. And this was a way of personalizing that to say so that people could ask about their experiences and have direct contact with them. And this, we found, was another way in which we could do this. Uh, This, uh, one of the current uh, work that we're doing, uh, much of it has to do with what's happening in Burma and Myanmar with the Rohingya. And this is something that our, my colleagues in the Center for the Simon Scott Center for the Prevention of Genocide have been working on. That it's not, it's uh, to raise awareness of this. And we actually did this um, small exhibition in the Senate Office Building as a way of raising awareness to politicians. And, uh, and, and influencers to try to get some activities done on it. The museum was early on, just as it was in Darfur, co- was calling attention to this long before it became, you know, uh, front page news. 2015 or so, the museum was call it raising, uh, raising uh, warnings that this, there was potential for violence and genocide in Burma and something needed to be done. You know, and it's something we're still doing. Uh, 
And so this is, these are some photographs of that, of that exhibition that we did there. But all this becomes you know, very important, and I think about, let me just, I can, oh, let me, can I go back to the next slide? Oops. But there's also ways in which you can use technology to elucidate the past by, by using things like, for instance, um, GIS, Geographic Information System, to, to give you new insights into what's happening in a genocide, or to understand that history very differently. And this was something that I thought was a kind of an interesting application. This is a 3D model that was constructed by German uh, prosecution, uh, by uh, uh, the German judiciary to prosecute former guards at Auschwitz. And they created this 3D model of Auschwitz as it was at the time that those guards were there. Now, what they wanted to do was to kind of refute some of the claims that some of the guards made. So, like if the, if the guard said, well, I couldn't see the gas chambers from where I was stationed, or I couldn't see groups of Jews or, or uh, pr other prisoners being sent or, or killed or whatever. So they designed this so that they could go into this model this 3D, you know, virtual model, place that person in where he was and say, okay, what could you see from here? And so this, but then I, then I thought, well, this has great applications for other things to understand what was going on at that camp, you know, that, that you could use this to plot out other things, you know, and understand, you know, the who's in these barracks, what kind of interactions, connections to the other prisoners did, did people have? What was, some people have started looking at music in these camps. When we tend to look at the, with, look at, you know, photographs or, or films of the Holocaust, it's silent, but there was sound there. And so how do you, you know, to capture that in a, in a way that doesn't trivialize the Holocaust or distort what's happened. But it's trying to get at these things that people weren't really discussing before. You know, looking at how this technology, you can map out death marches or you can map out killing sites. Why a particular site ended up to be chosen? What's the geography there? How close is it to that particular, that neighboring town? What could the, the locals see of that or understand what was going on? So there are a lot of applications of new technology. I'm working with someone dealing uh, with the Woods Ghetto, looking at the movement of people in and outside of that ghetto because there's a lot of big data that can be used to, uh, to shed light on that. Um, but so all these, we have a, a lot of opportunity to do some really remarkable things. We've got both these challenges that we face, but also I look back at the, the importance of what we're doing. You know, back in 1979, when the President's Commission on the Holocaust uh, came up with their findings and submitted those to both Congress and to the President. One of the things that they said is they wanted to have a living memorial. That is, it was to have a museum, an educational component, but also a committee on conscience. That is, and they wanted that committee on conscience, what they didn't want is that it was only going to be about the past that they understood that it had to be more than that, 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 the, that, that, it had to, that the museum had to be a way, uh, that, that the museum as a living memorial had to be a way to confront indifference and ignorance, and also to raise, to get people to think about what's happening in their own society, and also to be more, per, to see the ways in which democracy, for instance, 
you know, the, the, the consequences of the erosion of democracy in Germany and other places led to some horrendous things. And so that they, they laid this out and they, they envisioned at the time the creation of this Committee on Conscience, which became our Center for the Prevention of Genocide, that this would be made up of distinguished moral teachers, moral leaders throughout the United States who would get reports about genocide that was coming out and then use this to go to the public, go to the president, go to Congress in order to get, in order to halt that, those killings. And that was something that 1979 they were already talking about, the importance of that. That it was, that the museum had to look, for, look to the future. When Elie Wiesel spoke in 1993 at the opening of the, the museum, he was concluding his remarks and he said to President Clinton, he raised the issue of, of the, the killings that were going on in, Yugos, in the former Yugoslavia. And he said something has to be done to stop that. And, and you, you see this, that, and then of course the following year you had Ro, the Rwandan genocide that occurred, which you had in the course of a hundred days between 500,000 and a million people being killed by an extremist Hutu uh, government. So that the, those kind of issues continued. We had exhibitions dealing with Bosnia. We had trips shortly after the genocide that people from the staff went to Rwanda. And we continue that. We continue those, those connections. But the, the founders of the museum believed very much in the vision that we have now, which is that, it, and it's broader than most Holocaust institutions. And that it's, that is, we're a living memorial to the Holocaust, that is to inspire cit in citizens and leaders worldwide to confront hatred, to prevent genocide, and to promote human dignity. And it was something that, that, I, that I go back to that, that founding document about the importance of this, and, and they concluded by saying that History will not forgive us if we fail, but history will not forget us if we succeed. So they were that kind of there was that kind of uh, sort of optimism there that if you do this, maybe you can prevent genocide in the future. And so I want to leave off there because I think that's a kind of an intersection where we, you know, at the museum and the you in the institute here at, at Binghamton have a lot in common. And so we look forward to working with all of you in the future, and I want to thank you all for listening to me. Do you have a microphone for Or can, do you want, oh, this probably won't reach, okay. Yeah. Okay, back there. Well, I think that's something that, that we're examining. We've we've met with a number of teachers throughout the oh, let me let me repeat that question. You were asking if I'm, if I'm correct in this about the issue of some of the problems in teaching Holocaust education and how we would correct those or what kind of ideas are there to correct that. Well, I think one of the, the things that can be done there is to really start training more and more of these teachers, which we've been doing over the course of time. We've, uh, we've been very lucky to, to have programs where we bring teachers in throughout the country and let them come in, they get to hear people talking about it. They, they work together to kind of find new and innovative ways to teach this history and to, to raise questions with their students. And not just to say, well, I'm gonna throw on a, a DVD or stream some movie, but that we, and we also give them some things where they can have, you know, something that's 15 minutes long 
so they can use the other time, if they only have 90 minutes, that they can use that time to really get into the, the discussion of that. Because sometimes if, if you only show a movie, you're only getting one, per, one slice of that history. We're also, um, we've also had some teachers that talk about that maybe you don't start Holocaust education too early, that what you have and, and we've, had, we've had meetings with people who talk about Holocaust fatigue in the classroom. That's in some places they start in the third grade teaching it. And so that by the time they're in, in high school, they've had at least you know, small bits of information about the Holocaust uh, that, that, they, that you know, they're kind of tired of it. And maybe it's the same type of lesson all the time. And so that there's a kind of a fatigue that builds up and that can lead to kind of trivialization of that, that, that history, you know, with, with, with some of the students either coming up with games or like there was some Holocaust Jeopardy game that they were playing or, or you know, uh, but there are ways in which I think we can approach this in a more creative manner. You know, at one stage, when I, I often tell this to people, there, we ha we used to get um, teachers that would write in, and they would say, "What are the dimensions of the rail car that you have in the exhibition?" And when we asked them why they needed that information, they said, "Well, I'm going to put tape on my floor in the classroom, and force all the students to get in there so that they know what the experience of of someone going through the Holocaust being deported was," and we would say. That's not, that's not a good lesson. First of all, it's, it's not good for the students to be kind of scarred with that, but it also doesn't tell them anything. They're not re going through that same experience, and you don't want them to, but you do want them to learn about the Holocaust. So there are ways in which you don't have to do that kind of simulation, but there are other ways you can learn from this history in a, in, in a more productive way. So this is something that you know we've we've been working on, and that's going to change too. And and the ways in which students change, you know, and audiences learn, you know, and it might be through through technology, it might be through something else, it might be more one-on-one -on -one contact. This is relevant to the question. So by focusing on the Holocaust as this particular moment in history, we think that people who are too early to Well, I, I mean, you raise an interesting question, which is, you know, th there are a lot of debates among, oh, let me, uh, uh, let me reframe that if I can. You were asking the question about whether you, uh, you should, uh, the Holocaust should be taught in conjunction with other genocides and that should be viewed as, more, as Holocaust in the plural, if I'm... Yeah, and this is a, this is a debate among people that that engage in in uh, like comparative uh, genocides. So it's a, it's an issue that many people are are dealing with, you know. And some people have looked at okay, what are the warning? What are the common factors in all of these? Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. You know, I tend to see the Holocaust in some ways is very different from all the other genocides that have been perpetrated. Uh, it doesn't mean that uh, that the others are lesser. All it me all it means is that it's and I'll explain what I mean here. Uh, in most cases, and and most of the people that have done the work and compared with genocides have studied more contemporary ones and then trying to go back. But it doesn't always work. You know, when you look at the Holocaust, for instance, the Nazis, for instance, in most genocides that have occurred, it's tar the perpetrators have targeted a particular group in their, own in their own country. It might be the result of civil war, it might be you know, tribal warfare, but it occurs within that one area. 
The Holocaust was very different in that sense because the Nazis wanted to eradicate all Jews wherever they were. And that's far different from every other genocide that we've seen. That the, that the Nazis laid out, for instance, in, in, at the Wannsee Conference in, in uh, January of 1942, they laid out, they said, we want to get rid of 11 million Jews, including places they didn't occupy. They were thinking on the, in global terms. They weren't thinking, well, we solved it in Germany, we're done. That is, they were thinking about solving it as a, as a world, what they would see as a kind of world problem. And so I think that's, where, that's one of the ways it also differs. Also, in some cases, you know, when, we've, when we've dealt with some of those models in, um, you know, in looking at the Holocaust, some of them are saying, well, you know, genocides happen in these states that are failed states or collapsing states or weak states. And then I look at Nazi Germany, it wasn't. That was at the height of its power when it committed genocide. This was a, this was a, this was, had gone through economic recovery. This wasn't a state in decline. This was a, this was a, a state that was conquering territory from throughout Europe. So in that sense, it also was very different. Now, I think the study of other genocides is crucial. I think that shouldn't, that shouldn't stop because that's something we're facing more and more today. You know, and I think we have to learn from those and see, you know, just, you know, what's going on in those situations and make sure that we document all those cases, you know, and, you, and, and, and do something to stop those if possible. I think the key, the key is if you can prevent those from happening. I, um, when I was doing work on the Nazi propaganda exhibition, one of the things that I was struck by with the genocide convention is that there, it really deals with after a genocide's happened. There's only one clause in that, that deal that's really preventive. And that's the one where you can charge someone with direct and public incitement to genocide, even if it hasn't occurred. But that's the only one in there. The others are, you know, what you can do to, pro, you know, to deal with a genocide after it's happened. You know, and I think in some ways also what we've seen in the, in the kind of human rights community and the discussions is kind of a, a broader uh, discussion about, you know, mass atrocities. Because, you know, and I often figure, sometimes think that the term genocide, while, while important, is problematic because it's very legalistic that by the time scholars and lawyers decide what's a genocide, the genocide's taken place. That you have to have some other, and of course if you use the term, gen, if you use the term genocide, it compels you, it obligates you in some ways to intervene. So sometimes there's, you know, by uh, and, and you see this you see this in some of the documents that came out with the Rwanda. Don't use the G word. If you say genocide, that means we have to do something. We have to intervene. So I think now, you know, we're getting into this thing where people say, well, let's look at mass atrocities. You know, that it doesn't it doesn't have to be genocide to be a problem or a danger. And so I think, you know, we're seeing a lot of changes, the very, very interesting and good ones that are coming out of these discussions. Oh, did, did you have a question and then? Oh, okay, then let me go here. Thank you. Thank you for your talk. Oh, you're welcome. Um, you know, I mentioned technology, and I'm wondering, given all the different Holocaust museums that there are, is there any sort of linking through the Holocaust Museum in Washington of what they have? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So I know that artifacts, physical objects, are donated to them also. Yeah, yeah. So how does that work? And also, given all the objects that you have, where are they stored and how safely are they stored? Those are great questions. Uh, you asked a, a kind of broad question about the, the relationship and interactions and connections between 
uh, our museum and, and Holocaust institutions around the globe. And then you asked about uh, uh, objects that are donated to, to museums and also where are they stored. And those are all great questions. The, the museum is part of a, a uh, group, uh, there's an organization that was set up uh, hopefully I'll get it right. It's the Association of Holocaust Organizations. It started in 1985. So even before the museum, the museum was in the works, but it wasn't built yet. And it was started uh, in New York City. And it's expanded. Um, now, I, when it started, there were probably a handful or, you know, maybe at best 35 institutions, mostly very small ones that were part of that. Now I think there are over 400. And that's global. Now, the, uh, and the museum is also involved, and so we have connections through that, working with them. But we also are part of something, this um, ARI, uh, which is the European, I always, I always uh, get this wrong, but it's European Holocaust Research Initiative. And this is a, a number of different Holocaust organizations in Europe, and also including Yad Vashem, and we're a part of that, even though neither Yad Vashem nor the museum is located, physically located in Europe. We're a part of this. And what they have is this kind of sharing of information among institutions. What, what do you have in your collection? You know, and so that all this gets shared, and we've built up very close relationships with people there. And I've attended a number of those conferences and participated in it. So it's a, it, it's a great way of, you know, working together with you know, smaller institutions, larger institutions, and just learning from each other. Uh, the uh, institutions like, uh, all over the, the states and, and uh, in New York and elsewhere do collect objects, which is, which is great. You know, I think that the need to preserve these objects is, is important. And I think the, the challenge, I think, becomes particularly for smaller institutions, is the, the costs involved in all of that. Because often, you know, when we've dealt with, you know, sometimes the, the, the case comes up, people say, well, should we create a, a, um, a new Holocaust museum in some place? And then, you know, we'll sit down with them and say, okay, well, have you, th and then you say, well, are you gonna display artifacts? And they'll say, oh yeah, we'd like to do that. And I said, well, then you're gonna have to have a conservator. You've got to have the, who's going to write the labels, who's going to who's going to rotate those articles. That there's a lot of work. The, the, often people focus on getting the structure up, but not maintaining it over the long haul, and that takes money, and that takes a lot of time. And I think those are some of the challenges that 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 organizations uh, don't fully comprehend at the beginning. Uh, the Museum of Jewish Heritage is a, a remarkable place, beautiful location. I've spoken there, I've had exhibitions there. Uh, in fact, uh, a former Binghamton alum used to be the director of that, David Marwell, a good friend of mine. And another Binghamton alum used to be head of public programs there. And uh, so we had, a lot of, we had a lot of connections between Binghamton and, and Holocaust institutions. But they, they are doing a remarkable job. The, the person, one of the people that's uh, involved in this Auschwitz exhibition, Paul Salmons, is uh, from England. He worked on the Imperial War Museum's uh, Holocaust section. And uh, he's, also work, he's also at the museum now too. He's just dividing his time between, the, between New York, Washington, and England. But uh, so we, we benefit from all kinds of discussions that we have with him. But I think the, um, and the last point that I want to bring up, which is about what we, where do we store these objects. We recently built a uh, collections and conservation center outside of Washington, the Chappelle Center, which is state of the art. You know, it's, it's an incredible facility. You know, to, and because of the, our collection is growing, and the need to preserve this, you know, we, we decided we have to do this, we have to build this, and uh, so we did that. And we allowed it, to, uh, we bought enough property on that that it can expand. Because we, you know, as part of our rescue the evidence initiative, we want to try to get as much of this material 
as possible. And sometimes we don't tend to think about why that's important, but I can tell you this, that you know, stuff gets thrown out in the trash. You know, we, uh, and I know that from, you know, firsthand, from people telling me about that. There was a, one of, a Holocaust survivor who became a very good friend of mine, uh, but he, he would, he had, he would carry around this bag with documents. He says, Steve, I gotta show you something, I gotta show you something. And he would pull these bag, these papers out, and they were crumbling, you know, and, and I said, you gotta donate this stuff. You can't keep it in your house anymore. You know, it's gotta, and so he, he did that, and then he passed away, and he had even more stuff. And, but we didn't get all of that because some of it ended up getting thrown out. And so it's, you know, it's one of those, and I've heard people, you know, say, oh, well, I don't, I don't know what this stuff is. It's in a different language. They don't read that language. How do they know what it is? Well, if they don't read it, you know, that's, you know, that could end up being disposed of, thrown out. And, you know, you've lost that part of it. Sometimes things, you know, we get, we get people that'll say, oh, you know, my, my father, my grandfather passed away. We found this stuff in, in the attic. What is it? And we say, okay, where was your father? I don't know. Where, you know, what was, you know, who's in this? I don't know. And then what do you do with that? You know, it's very hard to, you know, you... Uh, you know, you have to kind of reconstruct that. But that's the importance of, you know, preserving this and, and, and having that information there. One of the things that I always tell people if they donate photographs, and our, our photo archives is great about this. You know, somebody hands in this class picture from Poland before the war. We'll say to them, who else is in the picture? So that survivor. Because you, that way, you know, because some of these people, you know, died in the Holocaust. So it's, if you can place a photograph with a name, you, you can help you know, preserve that person's identi identity. It might be the only thing that, that exists relating to that person, but it's so important to do that. And they're actually do, doing something similar to that at the Caserne uh, uh, d'Ossin in uh, Mechelen in Belgium. They've got a wall up there of the people that were deported to, uh, from Mechelen to, to Auschwitz. And, what they, uh, and they've, got, they've tried to put photographs of those individuals. And there's still a lot of you know, just circles where they have no photographs of people. But every time they find somebody, they put their photograph up there, which I think is a wonderful way of, of remembering. And uh, so I think that's so important. Now, I, I, Yes. Talking about archiving memories in the war wars, has there been a decision about archiving the memories of the second generation, the third generation, the children of survivors, and the grandchildren of survivors who grown up with this experience of, of being, of inheriting uh, the Holocaust experience from their parents, their parents, their great grandparents? There is no museum for the second and third generation. Has there been any kind of consideration you, uh, of you, other access? How do we do yeah, yeah. This is, a, uh, you asked the question about the, uh, the collecting or archiving of material from people that are second and third generation of, of Holocaust survivors. And this is something actually the, uh, Museum. We used to have a. Um, I don't know if it, I have to check um, if uh, you know how active it is. But we used to have a group that was second generation. Very. They were very active. In fact, I worked with them on an exhibition that I did uh, on uh, Jewish displaced persons. And of course, they gave us a lot of material from their family. They also shared with us a lot of their memories of of their experiences. A number of them had been born in in a displaced persons camp. And so we, we collected a number of things. I have to check our archival holdings. About, I think we do have diaries and accounts of, of and certainly there's a literature on, on, on individuals you know, from the second, and we've, we have that in our, 
in our collection too. But then there's also, we're working with a groups, and I think it started in, in New York, kind of third generation, working with third generation. And this is something that, you know, in some cases, they're very much interested in finding out more and more about this history, more and more about their families. And uh, so this becomes, a, it becomes a, a very much a part of their own personal history to learn as much as they can. So that's something that I think we're going to, tr we're trying to further as well. I you was know. at a conference which Dean Zell spoke mm -hmm. about the responsibility of the children of survivors. And, and, and he charged that, that the responsibility of bearing witnesses, bearing witness to the witnesses. Right. And, and of course, there's, there's a huge amount of literature about second generation. Right. Money, even third generation. Right. Who talked about growing up uh, in a household either being Yeah, I don't know if there's a specific arc. I know that some of those materials have been collected in various places, but I don't think there's like a specific archive that yeah. says, you know, this is an archive of second and third generation. No, I I yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I'll actually go back and, and check with my colleagues there because I know we've had, in the past, we've collected materials of it, but not as like a separate category, you know, and. Uh, but I mean, it's a, it's a good question. Um, any okay? Oh, no, you go ahead. It's me. Okay. Okay. Thank you so much for for the talk. I you mentioned earlier about not wanting to, to scar school children when when we're teaching them about the Holocaust. So how do you find the balance with educational materials between you know not being too sensational, but also not lowering the bar, you, you want to have some sort of emotional response, right? It's, and it's an emotional topic. So how do you find that, how do you find that balance between not scarring children to the point where they go home and they have nightmares, but also yeah. yet getting the, the message across? Yeah, I think that there are different ways that that, that can be done. Um, you know, I, m most of my experience has not been teaching at the, the high, even middle school, high school, or, um, or elementary school level, so I'm not probably the best person to speak about that because there are a lot more challenges to that. But the, um, I know in the past, uh, my kids were exposed to the Holocaust in, uh, in uh, English class, you know, not in a history class. And, and in both cases, they had like Holocaust survivors come and speak to their, their class. And for them, it was, and luckily, because of the proximity to the museum, to the schools in the area, they were, a lot of the survivors would go out there and they wanted to do that. And so that often would make, you know, for a very compelling experience for these kids. You know, sometimes when, um, when they come to the museum, it's very interesting, when they go see the survivors, you know, sometimes the survivors have their ID cards, you know, that, that we have in the exhibition. And uh, the kids will come over and they'll, they'll see the picture of this, of this survivor when she was young. And, she'll, and the survivor will say, well, I was your age when this, when it happened to me. You know, and they, t and they, they form this kind of bond. It's, it's very interesting to see that kind of interaction between the survivor passing this information on to this younger generation. And it, it's worked very well in the past. I mean, the sad thing is that generation's passing. You know, but when you think about the survivors that are around today, most were young kids then. You know, but uh, I know that this is uh, my, my um, 
my uh, daughter, or younger daughter, is an intern at the museum. And one of the projects she's working on is with they're doing um, these I don't know what you little films about survive the survivors and what interests they have. So that there there's one person that's interested in swimming, you know. So they film them swimming, or they or somebody is interested in you know, in collecting antiques. And it kind of rounds out that person, but it, it's, it's also, you know, they, they're, they're able to tell their story to, in a new format, in a new way, that, it, that doesn't just portray them as a victim static in time, but as someone who had a life before and a life after. And I think that becomes very important for people. I think there, there's just, uh, and I think sometimes those oral testimonies that the Shoah Foundation and the museum, our museum and others have, have created become very important. You know, USC at the Shoah Foundation is working on this. They've created the prototype for this hologram of survivors so that even after the survivors pass, they can be asked questions. And it's kind of an in interesting idea, but it's the idea that, that, that the survivors physically may pass, but the, the ability to ask them questions and learn from them will still be there. So I think that the, there are kind of a lot of ways that you can approach this, you know, without showing them, you know, horrific pictures or, or you know, or, or horrific experiences, but, uh, um, I mean, that's, those are just my thoughts on this. Yeah, Diane, you had a question. Yeah, it's, it's kind of a um, stick museum question that we discussed a little bit mm -hmm. today um, over lunch. That is, of course, you want to capture, you don't want anything to end up in the trash that would be valuable for others. And yet, as museums, we have to have collection policies that mean we have to say no to something. Right. So what kind of things um, are the, is the um, Holocaust Museum forced to say no to? Well, you raise a good question. I mean, what, um, what are the things that uh, initially, you know, for some of the things in the exhibition, there were, you know, uh, like Nazi banners that we used us. But we, we got so many that, you know, we were, that we would have to say, well, we don't necessarily need to collect anymore, but there are military museums, there are other museums that could use these. So if, if somebody wants to donate those, those could, those could end up in another museum. Um, there are things like, for instance, we don't display uh, human remains. So we, we, prob we wouldn't collect that, you know? And we also, some places, we, we don't take things that are, uh, taken from other um, uh, like sites, like from from Auschwitz. We used to we used to get people would donate things. They say, "Oh, I was walking around Auschwitz and I and I found these you know objects laying there or these things barbed wire. So I want to donate this." Or they got this, and we say, "Well, so we get return that to Auschwitz." You know that that's something we can't legally really accept into our, into our collection. Um, we used to accept, um, and I don't know what the policy is now, um, a, I'm trying to think how to describe this. You know, there were a lot of people that wanted to donate poems and things that they had written, and uh, so we had to actually kind of curtail some of that. Uh, but the, uh, uh, and, but for the most part, you know, we've collected, we've even collected, we get a lot of things that people have found like on flea markets. Now a lot of these things end up to be fakes. You know, there's a big, there's a big market in, in, in forgeries and fake Holocaust uh, things that, you know, stars, uh, uh, um, Star of David badges that were worn, uh, armbands, uniforms, all kinds of things, and people see, they you know, they see these in in flea markets all over, and 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 you have major collectors that, that have bought this stuff too, and it tends it tends to be fake. Either we identify it, you know, 
right off the bat as, as being fake and we won't take that. Or sometimes if, it, if we have it in the collection, we use it to, as a study collection. It's not accessioned into the collection, but it's something we can learn from. Like what materials are these fakes being made, for, uh, made of? You know, how are they made? Who's making these? Because we know that you know, we're gonna get a lot of this stuff you know, that people will keep offering it to us. And so we want to know more about it. But things like that we, we, don't, we don't routinely take. Often a lot of post-Holocaust uh, uh, art we don't really take as well. I mean, we, there are a lot of people that do that kind of work, but, but uh, you know, most of, I, I think we have very little of that in the collection. We tend to t collect things from the, the period and not uh, post-period. Um, at one stage, I thought, well, maybe we should collect, you know, uh, more contemporary genocide materials, and that, you know, that becomes a challenge both in terms of space and in, in terms of finances and all that. But I, but I do think that that's an important, that's that's important to, to be collected and preserved. I hope I answered that question. Okay. Yeah, you, ra you ra raise the question about what about older genocides, like the Armenian genocide. And um, we, ha we collect a lot of the scholarly material. We've had a lot of the, um, uh, we've, had, we've had scholars that are dealing with the, with the Armenian genocide come to work at the museum. Um, but there are other institutions. There's an effort made to create this Ar Museum of the Armenian Genocide in Washington and they're interested in collecting it. USC at the Shoah Foundation has been trying to collect as many of those, those um, oral testimonies or, uh, they collect uh, oral testimonies about the Armenian genocide. They're also collecting things dealing with the um, massacre in Nanjing in 1937 in, in China by the Japanese. So that they're collecting those kind of materials. They're also uh, interviewing Rwandan survivors and, sur and uh, others of more contemporary events. So they're seeing the importance of that. But they, by and large, their, their collection is, is oral uh, testimonies. So there, there are a number of, uh, they're also in, um, in Yerevan, uh, they also collect materials about this. I was there a couple of years ago uh, for a conference, and you know, they're they're trying to do a lot of things to to document the to document this, and also to to raise awareness about it. You know, in this month, it, it, well, last month now in April, they, you know, it's the kind of memorial of the Armenian genocide. So this is something that you know, uh, it, every usually every year it's brought up in Congress for a resolution about the Armenian genocide. So there are other institutions that are working on that, on that particular uh, uh, genocide. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, there's a sense of agency upon the curators or of, of the, of whoever's creating these images. And is there a sense of 
um, you know, what's the limit of how one can participate with these, um, you know, with, with these exhibits or museums that are, that are portraying very much of that. And I, 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 I recall the, uh, I watched the documentary Hooked, the Axis film, or an Axis film, and it was uh, filmed in Indonesia, and the filmmakers went there and met with generals and uh, participants in the uh, mass film economy right, in right. the 60s. Yeah. And I mean, in a sense, that was a representation of the Olympic event that calls for reflection upon the viewer. And but that was an egregious example of, of participation by the viewer. But it also was effective in some sense. So what do you think is the, the role of future curators, future uh, managers of, of, these, um, of these types of events? You know, not just the Holocaust, but yeah, yeah. all the mass films. Yeah, yeah. I, uh, you're asking about looking at the future. What is, you know, what are the ways in which I guess we can engage with audiences in places that are sites of atrocities or museums that deal with that. And that that's going to be a, a challenge because as our audiences change and as the passage of time uh, continues, those those become more and more in the distance. You know this. I remember, you know, we did an exhibition on uh, Cambodia and what happened there in the 70s with the Khmer Rouge and, and you know, I remember that. But the, most of the people that probably went through that, you know, the, that exhibition probably were too young to do that. Um, what was good about that exhibition is that it, it brought in a lot of people from the Cambodian community that lived in the Washington area. So these weren't necessarily pe people that would go to the Holocaust Museum, but they came there and, and, and saw this and, and were very, um, very honored that the museum had, had called attention to what happened to them. And uh, I think a lot, in a lot of cases, you know, museums are kind of in that kind of transitional stage about how you deal with engaging audiences over the course of time, you know, when these events seem more and more in the distance and, and, and other maybe new catastrophes, new, uh, hopefully no more new genocides, but mass atrocities occur, and then, you know, how do you balance the past and the present? And I think, you know, that becomes a challenge, but I think it's, you know, raising awareness and, and finding ways to engage with people. Maybe that's through social media, just to, to keep that in people's minds and so that they don't forget or to, to come up with, with films to bring this up, you know, as in this case of, of uh, in Indonesia, you know, the, um, um, I remember a number of my colleagues saw that, and they said, that, that's a very moving film, you know, that it's very powerful, and I think cinema, I think, can be a way in which, you know, you can get across those ideas to a mass audience and you know, really inform people about things that they never knew about before. And I think that, so I think there are a lot of ways you could do, do it, I think, creatively, but I think it's, I think it's something you have to, to work at and something that, uh, that has to be done you know, thoughtfully and, and with a certain amount of reverence as well. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. This thank you. Little, little token. That's a little nice little pad full of Hey. You. And I hope. Uh, and so, thank you, Steve, so much for for being with us. It was a. a, a it was just a real, a, a wonderful visit for for everyone. And we're so proud to have you as an alum coming back and doing this work. And I hope you would all. Uh, Stay and join us for a glass of wine and a nibble. And if you have some something else you want to talk to Steve about, uh, uh, please we can move outside of the hallway. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Man.